Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review of Better Call Saul Season 4, Episode 9. I believe it's pronounced Weidersheen, but I don't speak German, so don't get on me if I got that wrong. Ah, uh, God, the episode titles of Better Call Saul have been getting hard to pronounce for someone who's hard at pronouncing things like I am. Anyway, this video is part of a series of videos where I review uh, episodes of Better Call Saul. Uh, so I have to start with a spoiler the warning for Better Call Saul up to Season 4, Episode 9. If you haven't seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things will be spoiled for you. So, uh, this episode was pretty good. Maybe not the groundbreaking episode I was hoping for, because Episode 9s of Better Call Saul tend to be really amazing. Although, last year it wasn't so amazing either. It was still good, just like this episode was still good but not groundbreaking, so hopefully uh, the finale is going to be groundbreaking because this episode featured a lot of good setup. It was almost like a setup episode, setting up a lot of interesting things in the finale, but that being said, we did get some really great character interactions in this episode, some really great scenes, so let's just jump right into this. Starting with the uh, Jimmy and Kim storyline. So the episode starts out with... Uh, Kim, you know, going to this bank and you see where she's like doing a limp and she says she has a baby. She can, So you get the idea of the sort of running a con because at the end of the last episode, uh, Kim went to Jimmy and says, let's do more, meaning more cons. And so Jimmy comes in playing the part of her idiot brother and they accidentally spill the milk over the copy. But Kim so happens to have an identical copy right there and swaps them out. But of course we know the uh, copy may seem identical, but it's not. It actually allowed Mercer Verde to have a much bigger bank, which is what they wanted to. For some reason, Kim couldn't do it. Uh, so what's interesting is after the con, uh, Jimmy talks about how they should, you know, move in and uh, become partners again and, and do work their magic. But Kim is like, slam the brakes there, pal. <laughs> um, that they should only use their powers for good. And then Jimmy points out the very true fact, well, we just use our powers to get Mercer Verde a bigger bang. How is that for good? That doesn't seem like that's actually a charity case. And he brings up a very good point. And we, it was very evident in the previous episode that Kim gets, and actually throughout the show, because we get this earlier in season two, that Kim gets a rush out of doing cons like this. And particularly last episode, in this case, it was obvious that she just wanted to do the conning for the conning's sake. It wasn't for the greater good. It was actually a very tedious uh, reason to do it. It's obvious she was filing the work and trying to get the bigger bank and couldn't do it. So it's like, hey, it was an excuse for her and Jimmy to do the con because she enjoys doing the con for the con sakes, but she's not willing to admit this to herself. And so when Jimmy suggests, hey, let's just go con people all the time, she's like, whoa, because she doesn't want to admit uh, that she likes it or she doesn't want to do it full time. And uh, Jimmy points out the fact that, well, you know, when she says, oh, we should only do it for good. Because the thing with Huel, that was doing it for good because Kim... I uh, generally thought that the prosecutor was being too uh, tough on Huel and unreasonable. So she did that in part to get back at the prosecutor for being so, uh, so rude to her. And secondly, because for Huel's sake, because he thought that he was getting unfair treatment. So she you ran the con to get fair treatment. So she's saying to Jimmy, we should only do constant cases like that. But in this case, just to get Mercer Verde a bigger bank? Come on, that's not a very good reason. Uh, so anyway, uh, all the rest of the Jimmy and Kim stuff is sort of them gearing up. Jimmy gearing up to regain his law license. And uh, he's putting all his effort into it. And Kim's like writing out, you know, that mug we saw her give her earlier in the show. That said, Lord, wow. Uh, was it world's second best where she wrote second on it second best lawyer and she wrote again underneath uh, to congratulate him and preparing for him to get his license back and we see Jimmy you know, preparing himself and he goes in and he actually gives a really uh, convincing uh, really inspirational speech and he says later that it, he was being sincere and I do think for the most part he is being truly sincere he sort of he goes the extra um 
mile Jimmy does to, to oversell it. And I do think he kind of was overselling it a bit. And to me, I could totally see why someone would think that is coming off as insincere. However, the nail in the coffin, as Kim would point out later, is that not only, like Kim says it's because he didn't mention Chuck, but she wasn't there in the meeting. If you actually look at the meeting, and the details and the way Jimmy's talking. It's not just that Jimmy doesn't mention Chuck. He goes out of his way not to mention Chuck. Uh, because when he's talking about how, oh, when he grew up and he never wanted to be a lawyer, but he's, he got inspiration. Perfect opportunity. Who inspired him? His brother, because his brother uh, became a lawyer. And then Jimmy also talked about how I started in the mail room working for a law reform. Also, who gave him the job, who worked at the law firm, his brother. And so I think um, the judges there, or whoever you want to call them, the people who were determining whether or not to reinstate his license, like that one woman, I think she noticed this, and that's why she specifically asked any inspirations in your life. So she's giving Jimmy a really nudge, like almost like elbowing him, say, hey, mention your brother, here's the right part chance to mention your brother but of course they, she wasn't going to bring up uh, his brother herself because he wanted Jimmy to and he failed because he said oh Americans uh, University of American Samoa go crab or whatever they call fire um and so that's that's why I think they failed him they denied him they gave him one last chance to bring up his brother and he outright refused in fact and as it says, not just that he didn't mention his brother, it's obvious that he was going out of his way not to mention him. And so they could tell there was definitely an issue there. And this is important because his brother was a part of the main issue of how he lost his license in the first place because he attacked his brother and his brother was involved. So he needs to bring up his brother and show. I mean, him saying that he feels bad about it, what he did, and he's stupid, that's good and all, but he also needs to point out the fact that it had to do with his brother. And uh, the fact that his brother had passed away too, uh, obviously is a huge factor. And uh, he, it's something that he needs to mention. And I love how Kim was able to point that out to him right away. It's like, well, what do they say when you mention Chuck? He's like, why would I mention Chuck? And this, again, is perfect because it goes back to what we've been building to all seasons. That Jimmy has been avoiding talking about his brother the entire time. He's been avoiding dealing with it. He tries to avoid it at all costs. So it's perfect to see that that uh, comes to uh, bite him in the ass. And I love when Jimmy mentions Chuck, he's like, I, he mentions, talks about him like he still doesn't like him, like he's an asshole, he's dead, so what, who cares? <laughs> it's obvious that he does care, he's just not willing to face that side of him. And I think that it is that psychological part that wants to avoid uh, talking about Chuck. And it has to do with the way Chuck made him feel, the way Chuck viewed him, that he was worthless. So every time he thinks of Chuck, he thinks that he's worth it. And this is why, so we get this blow up between Jimmy and Kim, and this was this was an amazing scene. And what I love, it starts out where Jimmy is almost like projecting Chuck onto Kim, because he tells uh, Kim that she never believed in him, she just sees them as slipping Jimmy, and he just thinks that he's useless and he'll always be worthless. And that's what Chuck thought of him. So I don't think that is necessarily what Kim thinks of Jimmy, although I think he's touching on some things uh, that are correctly, but it seems like because she brought up Chuck and is making a big deal out of Chuck, he automatically assumes that Kim views him the same way that Chuck did. And that, that was very interesting. And of course, Kim like gets pissed off and sort of fights back against that, saying, I'm there for you all the time. I've done all this shit for you. How could you think that I think of you that way, the same way Chuck did? I should, I should have proved by now that uh, I don't think of you that way. But then Jimmy counters with some, some good points about how Kim keeps rejecting the idea of the office every time he brings up the offices. And again, that's, you can tell this is really important to Jimmy, that he really wanted to go in with Kim and work together. And he, and he finally brings up the fact, you know, why do you keep avoiding it? And Kim, of course, oh, why do you always have to be about this stupid office? Why are you so obsessed with this? And then I love how Jimmy points out, oh, so it's good enough to sleep with me. It's, it's good enough to hang out with me and do cons with me. But actually working together and doing anything professional, I am not good enough for you. 
And so <laughs> and this is great because, and I know that the season had been building to this point all season. I think they've done a great job of it because I was saying the whole time that Kim and Jimmy, you could tell they were growing distance. You could tell that um, uh, they were growing apart and they were growing distance and the relationship was dying. And we got a bit of a revaluation, a bit of a jump where they're doing the cons. But as I said in last week's episode, I could tell that was just that was just a quick fix, that it wasn't going to last. And I love how this latest uh, thing that happens with Jimmy not getting his license back, that was the uh, sort of fuse that exploded and the two of them finally explode and they finally start talking to each other and and stop avoiding the topics they've been avoiding the whole time how jimmy can't stand the fact that kim doesn't want to go in with him and thinks that 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 means that she basically looks at him the same way chuck's looks at him as worthless and just loving jimmy and kim finally blows up and be's like why can't you just accept the fact that we have different interests and different lives career-wise why can't we come together in other cases uh and, and so that that was an absolute brilliant scene and then later we get the follow-up uh, with Kim at home and Jimmy comes in and he has a suitcase and he starts packing and says obviously he's packing to move out and you could and what's interesting to me is that you could tell that Kim doesn't want him to go and that Kim wants or at least at the very least has uh, wants to reconcile with him and, and wants to sort of settle things and so she goes to him and just looks at him in the mirror and finally she says I asked him if she if he still if he wants to be a lawyer again and he says yes and she says that's a good place to start now I'm not sure if they are going to reconcile if Kim if that in fact is Kim's intentions maybe it's not maybe she just wants to help him become a lawyer again and then that's it and they'll know go their separate ways because I think it's obvious that they are moving in two separate directions but they do come together every once in a while such as doing the cons and stuff um, so it's interesting to see uh, where this relationship is headed so it has this a great setup but that that scene was very cathartic <laughs> when they finally yell at each other it was obvious it was been building to all season has been building to the build up to it was perfect and the payoff was perfect so one more thing I want to mention about Jimmy. It was interesting, and this is an obvious setup, uh, where Jimmy was talking about when he's reminiscing of Kim and saying that how he's going to become a lawyer again, that he's made a lot of clients with doing his illegal cell phone things so they're familiar with him. But, oh, they just happen to know me as Saul Goodman. Huh. Ha! <laughs> it's a very obvious setup. That's that's part of the reason why he takes on the name Saul Goodman. Although I don't think it's the full reason. I think uh, the coming fallout, whatever happens between Jimmy and Kim, is also going to be a major reason of why he's not going to want to use the name Jimmy McGill. Because of before, he's still all on board in keeping the name Jimmy McGill, and that's why he brought up, well, it's going to be hard because they know me as Saul Goodman. Something else is going to happen, but it's going to be easy transition. He's going to and. It's interesting that he already built up the clientele, and that's a, another interesting thing that's pointed out here, because when we first see Saul Goodman, he has a rich clientele of people, and he made a lot of connections, so it's actually showing that it's already established he already made a lot of those connections just to the cell phone thing, so that is uh, very interesting as well. Anyway, let's move on to Nacho and Lalo. I did believe his name is Lalo. So this is the character, uh, new characters. Uh, I believe Hector uh, Salamanca's nephew. He comes in to sort of take things over for Nacho, even though he claims that he's not, but it's obviously he is. And um, what's interesting, and it's been pointed out to me, and I went back and watched the episode of Better Call Saul, but this character was mentioned in Better Call Saul. I mean, sorry, Breaking Bad. In Breaking Bad, the episode Better Call Saul, which was the first episode that Saul Goodman appeared in, in Breaking Bad, uh, there's a scene where Jesse and uh, Walt are in ski masks, and they take Saul out to the desert and threaten to kill him. And obviously, they're just doing this because they want, you know, Saul to do what they want him to do in regards to uh, Jesse's friend. But uh, Saul, or Jimmy, uh, doesn't 
doesn't know who they are and thinks, assumes that they're from the cartel. So he starts speaking Spanish and he yells out, it wasn't me, it was Ignacio, which refers to Nacho, as we know. His name was Ignacio. And uh, then, um, you know, uh, Jesse says, shut up, speak English. And he's like, what, what, Lalo didn't send you? So that is interesting. <laughs> so it's an interesting setup. So they're definitely building towards something where Jimmy's going to do something involving Nacho uh, that uh, the cartel might want to kill him for if they ever find out about it. Or maybe it was Nacho who did it, and Jimmy is rightfully telling him that. Uh, but something's going to happen where if Lalo in particular finds out about it, he'd want to kill him. Now, this may or may not have to do with Nacho uh, drugging Hector. I, I, If I had to bet, I would say not. I would say we're beyond that. I think something else is going to come up that Lala would want to kill Nacho and him for if he found out about it. So <laughs> that is interesting uh, to think about, something to keep in mind. Anyway, uh, so I like this character, though. He's an interesting character because he's very different than most of the other Salamancas or most of the other even villains or cartel characters that we had in the show. Because most of, uh, most of the other ones were like deadpan and they sort of use fear to intimidate. Hector was definitely that way. I love the, the and, but Lalo is different because he uses, like he's very polite, he's very complimenting. I would, you could almost call it passive aggressive because it's obvious that it's all facade. That this politeness, oh thank you, oh you just try some of this food, is so great, oh I love your chicken, it's so great. And it's obvious that's just a shield uh, and he's actually a very dangerous underneath that. It's just a facade, a uh, polite facade to have, but he's actually sort of testing you. And instead of being openly adversarial, as most of the other characters were, it's just a way to sort of, I guess, try attempt to lower uh, other people's defenses. Although I haven't seen it work yet, particularly not with Nacho because he sees through it. And Gus, of course, sees through it. Uh, but Gus has that same, almost similar thing when he has his public face. He also, he's always polite, may I help you, blah, blah, blah. So Gus does a similar thing, but he usually just does that like in, in public. Whereas Lalo, he apparently does that all the time. And Lalo's, of course, is a lot more flamboyant about it, where Gus is still a bit reserved, like, oh, may I help you? Or Lala's like, oh, this is delicious, try this, and, and being really <laughs> in your face and about being polite, but it's obvious that he's actually very dangerous and that he's judging you while he's doing it. So that makes him a very interesting character, uh, in my opinion. And it's, it's interesting how they, um, when we, we see him go to Hector. Now, I do have to mention this thing with Hector. <sighs> This is probably one of the major, like, I wouldn't call it an issue, maybe a nitpick would be better, but it's something that I didn't really care for, is when Lalo gives Hector the bell. Because he, he makes, they make such a big deal out of it. He gives the, the backstory of how Hector viciously burned and killed this person, the only thing left was this bell, and he puts the bell up and Hector can use it to communicate with people. So, obviously the bell is iconic from Breaking Bad, because that's what Hector was most known for at first, was that's how he communicated with the bell. And so we see the origins of that, that's fine, but we, the bell doesn't need a backstory, I'm sorry, that's too much. It, it, it just, break, Better Call Saul usually is very good and not coming off as a prequel. It's, that's why many people rightfully call it the best prequel ever made because it doesn't hammer home the fact that it's a prequel too much. But this this scene kind of does, in my opinion. I know some people may disagree, but it, it has a whole like solo uh, Kessel Run feel to it. If you've seen the movie Solo Star Wars story, they do like take one lines and reference them from Star Wars and just, just hammer it home. Ha ha, get it, Kessel Run, ha ha. And, and that really annoyed me about that movie. And Better Call Saul usually doesn't do that. Usually it's just like the stuff with Ignacio and other stuff. That's earned. That's perfect. It makes sense. It takes these one lines and it expands upon it more. It's not a wink, wink, nod, nod. Whereas this bell thing does seem like a wink, wink, nod, nod thing. And they're making a much bigger deal out of it. I know the bell's iconic, but it doesn't need a, doesn't need a backstory. It's iconic enough by itself just by ringing it. You don't need to make a big deal out of... Uh, anyway. <laughs> that kind of irritated me. But... 
yeah, as I said, that's just a minor thing. I still loved uh, most of the interactions between Lalo and Hector, and particularly when he says he brings up the Chilean, which of course is Gus, so you can tell that uh, he, he doesn't like Gus, and he has it in for Gus. And so they go to the chicken joint, and you know, uh, uh, so Gus goes out, and it's like, may I help you putting the fa facade or whatever, and, uh, and Lalo puts on his own facade of, oh, this chicken's delicious, blah, blah, blah. And it's interesting that you have these two characters having a conversation, and, what, and the conversation is entirely in subtext. Because the words that they're saying has nothing to do with what they're actually saying, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, and I love that. That makes it a very uh, interesting scene. And I love how when um, when like Lala gets up to leave, Gus shoots a look, uh, like a very like his vicious look at Nacho, kind of like saying "What the fuck?" Because of course Nacho is his man. Nacho just throws up his hands, like I don't know, I have no idea, I have no, I'm in no control of what the hell's going on here. <laughs> so that was interesting. And then of course he takes Lala in the back room to have their discussion, and it's even though they're in private now, they don't have to pretend that they don't know that they're both working for the cartel. They still talk in, in subtext. Maybe not as much, but they still do it. <laughs> that is great. Now, he, you know, he, Lalo tries to get Gus to say, like, that they should circumvent Donna Laurie, and Gus, of course, turns him down. And then Lalo's like, yeah, no, I, actually, I was just kidding, because you should never betray Donna Laurie. That's a horrible, horrible idea. Now, I don't know if... I can't decide if Lalo was doing that because he wanted to entrap Gus to get Gus to say something against Don so then he could use it against him, or if he genuinely wanted to uh, wanted to break off from Don Alario and do his own thing. I would lean toward more towards the entrapment thing because if they wanted to break off, that would imply that he wanted to work with Gus. And that scene with Hector earlier, I think makes it clear that he still considers Gus an enemy, even though the whole scene is about him saying, oh, let's be friends, there's no reason for any hostility between us. And again, this is, I think this is his trying, this is his method of trying to, uh, you know, tear down people's defenses and make it seem like he's uh, their friend. That's his whole thing. And so <laughs> I don't think he's his friend at all, and in fact wants to go after Gus. So this is very good setup, and I'm very interested to see uh, where they go from here. Um, so... Finally, the other storyline we'll touch on is Mike with the Germans. Uh, this this was okay. This was probably my least favorite of the three storylines. I mean, it wasn't horrible. Maybe it moved a bit too slow for me. Uh, as where we get the title of the the episode. I'm not going to try to pronounce it again. But uh, it's kind of interesting how this is kind of subverting expectations. And I talked a bit about this in last episode, how early in the season they were building up Kai to be the big asshole, so as soon as I saw him, like, oh, he's going to be the problem person, but then last episode, kind of making it clear that Kai was a bit of actually of a red herring, that Warner was actually going to be the issue, and that's actually what happened in this episode, uh, that Warner was the issue, we had the deal where, the thing with the, um, the explosion not going off, and you had the really tense scene where Warner had to go in and defuse it. Now, I wouldn't call that a red herring or a fake out because at first I kind of thought of it as that because it was like they made it made it off as it was going to explode and he was going to kill himself, but nothing happened. It was fine, but that scene did serve a purpose, so that's why I wouldn't call it a fake out because it still served a purpose, and that purpose was to show how uh, Warner was losing it. When he went to defuse the run, he had he was like hyperventilating. He had to calm himself. It showed how much affected and how badly he wanted to go home. And so it was interesting. He went to Mike later and was like, "Look, can you please just let me visit my wife just for four days, just for five days, please, please, please?" It's very important. And Mike, of course, turns it down and says, "No, just you can spend as much time with her as you like. You'll be rich. Once we finish the job, just." finish the job and then you'll be sweet and uh that obviously was not good enough for him and he was losing it and so he finds a way uh to to break out uh which is this interesting setup as i said interesting setup interesting revelations i said earlier that i believe because mike has not become gus's uh like right hand man yet he's just mike is at the moment he's just doing this one job for gus 
And at the moment, like, as I said in earlier seasons, Mike still is very much against killing, which we see in Breaking Bad, he's not. <laughs> he's a no half measures guy. He doesn't mind killing. I think predictions now, I think that Mike is going to have to kill Warner, and that's going to lead to him becoming more cold and more of a cold killer and moving away from that no-killing mentality that he had earlier in the show. Just my prediction. Uh, we'll see how things go. As I said, the show has a uh, very good, very excellent ability to subvert expectations, but I, I don't think it would be such a bad thing if, if things did go down that way, but we will see. So anyway, my rating for Wiedersen out of 10 is an 8. Extremely good. Uh, really great episode. Uh, really interesting. Strong. Uh, maybe not one of my favorites of the season, but still very good. That blow up between Jimmy and Kim was outstanding. I uh, was getting to know Lalo and seeing his whole uh, <laughs> passive aggressive facade. It was very interesting. And of course, getting the whole thing with Warner bringing out good setup. So, uh, definitely good episode. I uh, can't wait to see where they go uh, next. So, that is it for my review of uh, Better Call Saul Season 4, Episode 9. I will be back next week to review the finale, Episode 10. And then after, I will also return for my overall review of uh, Better Call Saul Season 4 as a whole. So, be sure to check that out. Also, check out my channel as I do uh, many more videos and other shows like Star Trek, uh, Game of Thrones, The Expanse, Lost, and more. So, be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.